Life isn't a game. It's a series of games. And the right ethic is to be the winner of the series of games. And part of that means you, well, you have to learn how to be a good loser because yes. you're not going to win every single game. But you also have to embrace those losses as learning experiences. And the people that have never lost are afraid of losing. Mm -hmm. They're afraid of learning. Mm -hmm. You're afraid of that feeling. That terrible feeling that you get from losing is so beneficial. It's aided me in so many ways. Like It's one of the reasons, also one of the reasons why I talk so openly about bombing on stage. And I, t I do it with other comedians. Mm -hmm. I, I always want to tell people, yeah, I'm an established comedian. I've been a comedian for a long time. Let me tell you about like when I was two years in or five years in or, or four years ago. Like, let me tell you about some horrible moments on stage where it went wrong. Just so you understand, like those things took me to another place. Yeah. Because I realized I don't want to ever feel that feeling again. And so I ramped yeah. everything up. And then I went back to work and I went over my notebooks and I went over my my recordings and I figured out what I was doing wrong and, and I tried to improve upon it. But if, if it wasn't for that horrible, sick feeling, that's the same feeling you get when you get tapped out in jujitsu class. Same feeling you get when you lose a martial arts tournament or anything else. Losing is important. Well, you might also say, like, let's say that you could pick your you can pick your level of competition in life to some degree. Okay, so let's say you pick a level of competition where you're always winning. It's like, well, all that means is you've picked the wrong level of competition. Yes. Let's say you're a grandmaster chess player and you're, all you do is play amateurs. And every night you go home and congratulate yourself on what a genius you are because you just stomp these people left, right, and center. It's like, you're not a genius. You're dimwit. Right. What you should be doing is playing people who are beating you like, well, as much as you can tolerate. Right. So maybe that's 40% of the time. Maybe it's 60% of the time. But that way, because to be a winner, you want to be disciplined. You want to know what you're doing. And then you want to be on the edge where your skills are being developed. And if you're going to be on the edge where your skills are going to be developed, you're, you're at a place where, where losing is always a possibility. Because otherwise you're not pushing yourself beyond your current capacity. One of the things that I've outlined in 12 Rules for Life is a theory of meaning. Because meaning is the antidote to malevolence and suffering. Because you want to have a life that's so engaging that you think, despite the fact that I'm limited and that we're mortal and that life is tragedy and there's evil in the world, despite all that, this is worth doing. And I think that there's a technical meaning that genuinely exists. And that's the meaning that you get when you're in a domain where you have some discipline and some skill. So you're laying out your competence and, and your your ability, but you're simultaneously pushing yourself to develop past where you are. That's really engrossing. And what's that doing is expanding your competence. And so life is suffering and betrayal in many senses of the word, but you can adopt a way of traversing through life that is more powerful than the tragedy and the malevolence. Truthful conversations redeem people. If you speak the truth, and you expose yourself courageously to those things that you're afraid of, that your life will improve, and so will the life of people around you. As far as I'm concerned, that's as close to undeniable fact as we've got. And it also dovetails nicely with the underlying archetypal stories, the heroic stories. It's like, go out there, find the dragon, confront it. It's a dragon, it might eat you, it's dangerous. But it's worse to cower at home and wait for it to come and devour you. Go out there, confront it, get the gold, share it with the community. It's like, yeah, it's the oldest story of mankind. One of the factors in the resistance to these ideas of discipline and of taking responsibility for yourself is people recognizing that they're not doing that in their own lives and they get upset and instead of looking internally, they try to attack the thing that's upsetting them. They, they attack your message, they attack the philosophy behind it rather than look internally and objectively and having some sort of introspective point of view where you go, okay, Am I uh, reacting to this because this, this resonates, like I'm, I'm missing this aspect of my life? Does this diminish me or is this guy pointing something out that I can benefit from? Very few people are willing to do that. Very few people are willing to take that critical moment to look at their own behavior and look at their own thought process and wonder if mm. the actual adverse reaction they have to this person's message is because they know that they're wrong. There's evil in the world of all sorts. And some of it's the evil in other people. And some of it's the evil in your brother's heart. But the part of it that you can really do something about, that's the malevolence in your own heart. You can actually do something about that. And that's actually way more useful than you think. Because if you can face it in you, then you start to understand it. And that also makes you strong enough to identify it and to fight it when you see it in the external world. Like there's lots of people all over the world going out and doing reprehensible things. And you might say, well, you should go out and protest against them. Like then sometimes you should, but most of the time you should think, where am I falling short? Where am I less than I should be? Where am I bitter? 
Where am I making the world a worse place than it has to be? Now, if you ask yourself those questions, you'll be in for a big shock. Stop saying things that make you weak. Stop telling lies that you know to be lies. Stop doing things you know to be useless and counterproductive. Aim high, adopt some responsibility, and then see what the hell happens. Yeah, the, the perception that people have of ultimate success and ultimate happiness is, uh, it seems motivated by what they don't have, rather than an understanding of what success and happiness really is. Their, their idea is that one day I'm going to go and I'm going to be in my golden years, and I'm just going to be able to sit around and do mm. nothing and tell everybody to fuck off. <laughs> You won't be well, happy I at had, all. Yeah, I talked to, to, to one of the people that I was working with who had a, like a vision for retirement. I said, well, what's your vision for retirement? Well, I see myself in a beach, you know, some tropical country drinking margaritas. And I thought, at first, that's not a plan. That's a travel <laughs> poster. It's like, okay, let's, let's walk through this. All right, so you go down to this tropical country and you go sit on the beach and you have a margarita. It's like, okay, well, how many margaritas? Like 10? <laughs> okay, so you're gonna do that. What you're gonna do that for six months? You'll be dead. Yeah, well, you'll be this like pathetic, sunburned, like fat. Yeah, yeah. unhappy, yeah. hungover, cirrhotic. In pain. Yeah, yeah. It's like that's Dehydrated. your vision. Dehydrated. So uh, how long can you have a margarita on a beach? Like maybe you can do that once every six months for like ten minutes, something like that. <laughs> it's not a vision, and it just doesn't work out. So yeah. And the thing that sustains people through life really is the lifting of a worthwhile burden. It's something like that. Yeah. And it's partly because we're social animals, right? It's like we're evolved to be useful to the people around us because they're much more likely to let us live if we're like that. Yes. So the world is a lesser place if you do not reveal from within yourself what you have to reveal. And the fact that the world is a lesser place actually turns out not to be trivial. Like if you aren't everything you could be, more people will die, more people will suffer more evil will be unconstrained, more tyranny will reign, more chaos will remain chaotic and dangerous, all of that. Your family is more messed up than it could be if you were less messed up than you are. Right. So if you just got your act together, like 10% more, your family would be 1% better. Right. It's like, well, do it. And that would ripple off into that, the oh, people yeah, that they inter yeah, yes. interact yes. with. And, and yes, ripple, and it ripples fast. Yes. That's the other thing that's so cool is that, like people think, well, there's seven billion of us, and each of us is just this separate dust moat, like floating in the cosmos, and what the hell difference does it make what you do anyways? It's like, that is not how we're connected. It's like, you're the center of a network, and you know, well, you know way more people than this, but let's say typically, you know a thou you're gonna know a thousand people in your life, well enough to have an impact on them, okay? And each of those thousand people is gonna know a thousand people. So you're one step from a million, and two steps from a billion. And we are networked, technically. That, that's how human interactions work. And so, when you do something that you shouldn't do, it's worse than you think. And when you do something that you should do, it's better than you think. This is why I've been telling people, well, clean up your room. It's like, well, your room is actually networked too. It's not that easy to clean up your room. So you want your room to be set up so that when you walk in there, it tells you to be better than you generally are. It's organized, it's got direction, everything's in its place. You try to do that in a chaotic household. So I'd say, look, pick a small moral goal, clean up your room, and just write down what happens as a consequence. So maybe these are students in a chaotic household. The whole place is a bloody mess. No one's taking any responsibility for anything. And so they decide they're gonna to start to clean up their room. And then the people in the household notice. Well, the first thing they do is get pissed off. It's like, who do you think you are? Like, you think you're better than us? You th like, why do you think this is worthwhile? Who made, who died and made you God? All of that. So just by trying to organize this little part of their life, they immediately run into the people whose actions they're casting in a dim light by trying to improve themselves to some degree. They might have to have like a thorough war in their household to be allowed to do something as simple as keep the room orderly. They find out very rapidly that A, that's way more difficult than it sounds, and B, that the consequences of it are far more far reaching than people think. So that's quite fun.